My name is Aaron Zettlerman, I'm the Executive Director of Circle, the South Hebrew River Citizens League. Welcome everybody to this film and this panel. Really excited to be here. It's going to be fantastic. For those who don't know, the Wild and Scenic Film Festival is a production of Circle, the South Hebrew River Citizens League. We're a local nonprofit for over 40 years. We've been uniting the community to protect and restore the Yuba River watershed. Circle's Wild and Scenic Film Festival inspires environmental activism and a love for nature through film. Our goal is to encourage everyone to learn more about ways that we can do more to save our threatened planet. And on that note, we would encourage all of you to sign our petition. Every year there's a Film Fest action, and this year with our theme of real action, it's incredibly poignant to try to save the threatened salmon, and so we are asking Governor Newsom to make sure that there's enough water flowing from the Yuba all the way out to the Golden Gate Bridge so that our salmon can make their journey out to the sea, come back, and spawn. There's more information at the action table on your way out, so please join us in letting and telling Governor Newsom to let the salmon swim. So the film this, e that we're, this evening, this morning, that we're all here to see, is California's watershed healing. It provides an in-depth view into the connection between forest health and water security. And afterwards, as I'm sure you are all aware, we're gonna have a fantastic panel discussion with Dr. Roger Bales, Dr. Martha Conklin, we've got Secretary of Natural Resources, Wade Crowfoot, Ellie Lano from the Forest Service, and Willie Little Z from Yuba Water Agency. I'll be moder moder moderating it. It's still early, apparently, in my mind. Um, really looking forward to that. In addition, this festival couldn't happen without the tremendous local and national support. Hundreds of volunteers are working with us to ensure that this festival is a success. Please join me in giving them all a round of applause. In addition, there are a number of individuals, local and national business partners making this event possible. We would not be here without their support, and so please learn more about their mission and how you can help support them. To that point, this session is very generously sponsored by Yuba Water Agency. Thank you very much for your support of this event. You can also support Circle and the Wild and Scenic by making a donation and or becoming a member. All funds during the festival, up to $10,000, will be matched, dollar for dollar, and that was a great time to join, to renew, to make a donation. You are supporting the critical work that we are doing to protect the Yuba River. Um, you can sign up to become a member at the Yuba River Action Tables or at yubariver.org. So this is where I turn into a little bit of a flight attendant. Emergency exits, there's behind you, there's one on the side, there are some back here. As we leave the theater, please only go out that door. We're full um, and with a little bit of standing room around the back, so if you've got waters, coffees, things like that, make sure you've got a good grasp on them. Lids are on tight so that if you kick them, they don't fall over, they don't make a mess, that kind of thing. We heard a great reminder, make sure your cell phones are off, silented, that kind of thing, so that they don't go on during the theaters. I think we're good in terms of seating. I don't see any, any gaps, which is what we want. Um, and so before we kick it over and start the film, I would like to introduce the director to come up and say a couple words. Jim. I'm uh, very honored once again to be in this film festival. Um, this is something that I cherish, particularly this community. I grew up in these mountains, uh, Berkeley, where I live, but I've spent quite a bit of time in these mountains, and they mean a whole lot to me. It's kind of home to me. Uh, and that is kind of way it, way it sort of oriented me when I did this film, because it just felt like I was coming home. Um, and, um, and I want to thank those who were in attendance, who were participating. This is really important to me. You've, take, you've honored the film by you being here, and I really appreciate it. And, 
and you'll, I'm sure you'll, as was mentioned, it'll be a fantastic panel discussion, and, and I'm also honored the fact that all of you have shown up. So anyway, you don't hear me. Hear me. <laughs> think of water, watershed as, as a security issue, but when you back up the bus and you look at what are the foundational principles that our safety and security are, are relying upon, it's climate security, water security, food security, and you know ensuring that those things are adequately taken into account and planned for is uh, an unmet challenge, I would say, in the United States. The impact or the relationship between snow, snowpack, rain, rainfall, the health of the forest, and then wildfire is direct, and it's caused loss of life and loss of property in California. All right, well, thank you all very much for being here. Fantastic film. Um, before we kick off the Q&A, just introduce everybody that we've got up here. Starting on the left, we've got Dr. Martha Conklin. She's a professor emerita, ooh, emer, emerita of Civil and Environmental Engineering from UC Merced. Dr. Roger Bales, professor of Engineering and Management at UC Merced. Secretary of Natural Resources, Wade Crowfoot. Forest Service um, Supervisor Ellie Lano and Jim of Yuba Water Agency. We'll, we'll see at, there at the end. Um, so I imagine there are questions in the audience, but I have the mic, so I get to go first. <laughs> um, there are, you know, a number of themes, of course, throughout this film. But one of the ones that, as sort of the community outreach portion of the film, the story I really like, is the the need and the opportunity for helping people understand education and one of the big ones there is like what does a forest a healthy forest actually look like and when we think healthy forest is that actually healthy anybody want to sort of comment are there other themes other sort of big education opportunities where shifting public perception generally is going to be really important to keep this kind of work moving forward successfully and happy to pass the mic to well, thanks, and, and thanks, Jim, for making this movie. I think it was really, really well done. And it's, it's awesome to be here at Wild and Scenic with Circle, that was referenced in the movie, with the Uber Water Agency that's providing a really big model. So you guys are actually showing the way forward. Look, I think this is a paradigm shift. Um, you know, our agency that I lead includes CAL FIRE and our Department of Water Resources, Fish and Wildlife, Sierra Nevada Conservancy, Tahoe Conservancy, so we're right in the middle of all this. And for all of us, this has involved a lot of learning. I, I, you know, coming into this job, I never had any conception of the traditional practices of Native Americans and, the, and to, the, to the scale that they've um, exercised that over time with this cultural fire. And it's been a paradigm shift. I mean, my, you know, my uh, formative years backpacking in California, a healthy forest was the super green forest that you couldn't see through. And I, I had that, I and mean, I really, re it resonated with me when you saw you know, charred uh, ground being negative. I think this is this has really involved a paradigm shift. Um, likewise with prescribed fire. You know, we still have a lot of challenges putting fire on the ground across the state because people are scared of fire for good reason. And they don't understand, you know, the benefits. And the smoke impacts, the local smoke impacts can be intense. So to, to me, there's, there's continued education that has to happen. And that's why Circle and groups you know, legitimate, valid, you know, validated groups on the ground are really important in helping educate people what we need. Yeah, I'll just add, uh, so Wade just said paradigm shift, and I heard in the film um, social license, and um, I also want to thank Jim for putting this film together, and this is an educational tool to educate you all on what is actually going on in our forests and the Sierras, and this is just one step in a major effort we have to restore our forests, and social license, I think what this film does is it kind of confirms what we we have done, especially Ellie and Yuba Water in, in our local backyard here, we've basically 
assume that we now have social license to restore our forests and get away from this, um, you know, loving our forests to death. I grew up um, loving our forests the way they were, but um, unfortunately that, it was talked about in the film, that lack of decision or the management decision to let our forests just grow was a management decision. And now we need to shift away from that. We need to go do something. And Ellie summed it up in the film. I think he said we either need to go re thin these forests by hand, mechanically, or with fire. I mean, it's that simple. It kind of closed out. There, it, it's, there's simple solutions to this stuff. And I think what by sitting here with you today is we're confirming that we have social li license to go do this. That, that's what I would like to do, or, or at least talk about. Do we still have, okay. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for being here. Um, so I, I think there's often this uh, perception that it, if we don't do anything, things are gonna stay the same. And I am here to tell you that that is absolutely not true. Um, you, you, wildfire is one that, that people talk about a lot. But I also want to share, even when we don't have big wildfire years, our forests are still changing. So in 2023, last year, just on the Tahoe National Forest, 6.5 million trees died. And the, and the year before, that number was 3.5 million. And that's a result of climate change, droughts, and all those stressors. So even when we don't have big fires, our forests are dying because of everything that you heard about, climate change, overly dense conditions, disease, drought. Um, and and so, so in some ways, the forest is speaking to us. It's telling us that there are too many trees. However, if we leave all of those, over the last two years, about 10 million trees just standing there, the, the risk of large-scale fire increases substantially, right? And then, if there is a fire, it's, it's, it's changing. It, 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 it not only takes out those standing dead trees, it takes out all of the trees at a very intense rate. And, and that's, what, that's what you saw. And it makes it very difficult after a very intense fire for those forests to return. I'm not saying it could never happen, but it certainly won't happen in any of our lifetimes. So, um, so, so I think this, this, this notion that if we don't do anything, things are gonna stay static. We just have to get out of that mindset. I know that for some people it's troubling to see machines in the forest taking out trees, but I just wanna tell you that we are doing it with the best science available to us. We're not saying it's perfect, but we're saying that it's better, that we're making progress towards something that we all want, which is a sustainable forest and a sustainable watershed. And I just wanted to add something I learned. When it, I think it was one of my first field trips. It was listening to someone that was um, on the, at the King Fire and talk. It was, a, it was someone in the, in the, in the um, fire service. And they were talking about standing on the ridge and hearing the animals that were burning. And that is something I just want to think. We've talked about the trees, but we're really talking about the whole ecosystem. There's nothing left at a catastrophic fire. And I think that's, you know, so, you know, when we think about it from a human perspective, we also need to think about it um, from a biodiversity perspective and really some of the things we really love. So I just wanted to add to that. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Hands is a quick one there. Yeah. Um, I mean, what we see in urban areas is the insurance companies just cutting and running. We're leaving the state. We're not insuring your house. Oh, you have an IV growing up. Um, I heard a glimmer of hope that insurance companies are approachable and maybe see this as a preventative. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, so the question was about insurance companies, somebody, something that is near and dear to all of us that live up here, and sort of insurance market forces and pressures maybe moving those industries out of the system, but hope for getting them to stay and so we can live here. Send that one down, it's probably a little easier. Come on. Um, great question. So we have seen a little bit more involvement by the insurance industry uh, in a couple of fronts. So you heard Zach Knight in the film talk about the forest resilience bond. So a couple, 
not a lot, but a couple of insurance companies um, have invested in that forest resilience bond. Now they're expecting a return, but but they are investing. They're coming out on field trips. They're coming into the forest. The other thing that we are trying to do is so in the insurance industry that they have this disaster model, and we're, and for the most part, all the work that you saw, all the work that we're doing in the forest does not get included in their disaster model and and reducing risk. So we're, so we're really pushing them to show the research that, that this kind of work does reduce risk. Um, and so in those communities and in those places where we are doing this risk, that they take that into account into, into their models. Yeah, I was just going to acknowledge it. First of all, it's a huge problem, not only in California, but the rest of the country. Uh, I spent some time with our insurance commissioner, which is like a publicly elected statewide office recently. And there's a National Association of Insurance Commissioners. And the insurance commissioners in the Gulf states, for example, are experiencing the same thing, where insurance companies are pulling out because the risk of hurricanes and the threats from the hurricanes have gotten so large. So there's a big question around, given all of these changes with the changing climate and the impacts, Broadly, how does that, how is that going to infect insur affect insurance across the world? In California, you know, our insurance commissioner has the potential to set certain standards on the insurance companies, including the amount of rates that they can pay. The challenge is, you know, some insurance companies will drop out of California versus abide those rules. So it's a real balance. One thing we're working on in Sacramento is to Ellie's point, can we, can we have the insurance companies recognize where the work is getting done and then provide affordable insurance uh, plans f in those areas, including you know, if, if your home is, it has the defensible space that it technically needs, if your community actually has fuel breaks around the community, et cetera. And we're seeing a interest from the insurance companies. But I can tell you, it is priority 1A in Sacramento among these you know, state leaders to figure out this insurance problem because it's untenable that rural people can't get insurance or affordable insurance. Saw Roy first there. So um, in the state, in the county of Nevada, the Fire Safe Council is doing, I think, a great job to help neighbors understand how important it is to give up the vegetation, the concentration of trees in their 5, 10, and 20 acre areas. However, there are a lot of neighbors who say, well, I moved to the woods to have the woods. So there definitely needs to be a change in attitude about being safe, getting insurance, and enjoying your privacy. So how much are you folks working with individually Fire Safe Councils, um, supporting firewise communities, and um, looking at it from the individual standpoint of their role being surrounded by the forest. So the question for the recording and all of you is about the relationship between firewise communities, which are responsible and kind of help lead the sort of forest conservation, forest clearing work that we saw in the Tahoe, but at the individual parcel, so really bridging that gap between the wild lands, the Tahoe National Forest, and the buffer, the urban corridor, um, and the sort of cooperation, collaboration between those two entities. Well, that, that's a topic, a great, a great topic that involves both research and policy. In the film, you saw Crystal Colden, the professor at UC Merced, and that's her research area. And I, I, I hesitate, but I can say, contact her for for what's 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 going on. We don't, Martha and I, don't really work on at that at that level, but there is. There are many people working on the research side of how we can better do that. And the policy side? <laughs> <laughs> well, we think about it in concentric circles. So that, you know, the, the smallest concentric circle, concentric circle is in the community. And abs to your point, there are things that communities need to do to keep themselves safe. And there's things that residents need to do to keep themselves, themselves safe. So fire safe council is absolutely essential. Those communities that are fire wise communities, absolutely essential. We know, for example, that Paradise, you know, as destructive um, and tragic as that was, lives were saved because of the work of their fire safe council in terms of getting people out. And they had actually done some thinning uh, uh, along the roads that were actually, uh, you know, places where people escaped. 
So absolutely important. And our, our CAL FIRE is working to address that challenge. Yeah, we, we get it. People like to be in the woods. You don't want to look right at your neighbor. That's in part why you got that, that three-acre parcel, right, and moved up to the mountains. But, you know, look, look what happens if we actually, you know, don't, we don't do what's needed. So Titus concentric circle in the community, then around the community. We need fuel breaks to let firefighters take a stand to protect these communities. That's likely what saved South Lake Tahoe in the Caldor fire, was those, those fuel breaks that the Forest Service up there put in with the community. And then what we saw here is that broadest concentric circle is landscape wide. Um, because at the end of the day, if there is a catastrophic wildfire in the North Yuba watershed and it gets hot enough, it doesn't matter what, um, what fuel break exists, especially given these ember-driven fires. So you need all three. And I'll expand on that, all three. So um, I think the question was, what are you all doing to you know, help these firewise communities or local fire safe councils? And so Wade just talked about the concentric circles, and he built out from basically like the home or the community out into the landscape or the, the forest. Yuba Water Agency, because of our interest as a statewide water manager and a watershed manager, we work from the outside concentric circle in. And so we're directly investing with Ellie and others in landscape scale forestry, but we also locally are sponsoring our Yuba County Fire Safe Council in educating the public on home hardening, educating the public on if you develop a community-based fire-wise plan or fire safe plan, we will help invest with you to get the work done to thin the forest around these communities. And in fact, we have not only partnerships with the Tahoe National Forest for funding and implementation, but in the non-Tahoe National Forest area, the state responsibility area, we have partnerships with Wade's group, the Cal Fire, in healthy forest grants to thin the forest on these, I heard someone say, the five, 10, and 20 acre parcels. We're helping implement forest restoration on a smaller scale on those parcels, kind of like the urban-rural interface with the help of CAL FIRE. So it is the concentric circles and is who is investing and working in what circle and Yuba Water Agency starting on the outer circle but working into the, the inner circle with the, the community-based projects. So, so I had a question there and I think one over there as well. I just read a little snippet that said one of the biggest changes in our future is zoning changes, the way we live and work, and travel and recreate. What I see along the foothills of the Sierra is a tremendous effort to develop into the wildland urban interface and change land use from agriculture, from timber, into residential development. And it just seems to me that somehow we need to do something about it. I just saw the Attorney General help to purchase a land development down in San Diego County to take it out of the development plan and leave it as is in the wildland urban interface, we need to do more of that. Any comments? So anybody uh, comments on the idea of making sure that some of those wildland urban interfaces areas stay that way and the desire to develop and push into those forest boundary areas um, sort of slow down so that we don't have the high density of housing? I mean, that's another really just uh, let me acknowledge that as a really sticky challenge in California. So typically, you know, local or land use is a, is a local decision. And particularly rural counties that don't have a big tax base, you know, that need affordable housing for folks that want to live there and work there, build out into the wildland urban interface. About one quarter, about 10 million Californians live in these high hazard wildfire zones or this urban wildland interface. So it's a big, there's a big balance that's needed. Right now at the Board of Forestry, which is sort of the regulatory body uh, on, this type, on this topic, they're updating guidelines around um, what development is actually even allowed uh, in that urban wildland interface. What access and egress do you need? Um, you know, what is, what's absolutely prohibited? And it's, it's challenging. There are really intense groups on, on every side. Those that wanna push more housing, um, larger communities, those that are terrified about, you know, those communities creating more fire risk. So you'll see updates around those, those regulations, those prohibitions, but it's going to continue to be a balance. So I've got a question there, then close, hey, hey, Aaron, then back. Aaron. Can I, can I oh, add sorry. to that last question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, sorry. To, to jump in. Um, so yeah, uh, the zoning and land-based stuff is a, a local, local issue, and I'll give you a, kind of a local perspective from, from Yuba County. The uh, CAL FIRE fire severity maps were just updated within the last month, and so I open it up, I look at it, and where, I look at where I live, and I say, oh, you know, great. Um, I live in a floodplain. 
okay? So I'm, I'm safe, right? <laughs> but then I look at what, where the, the fire severity is in our foothills, and it's like, oh my gosh, like, we're looking at high and extreme um, in most of the foothills of Yuba County. Well, then if you, I mentally, I don't see it on the map, but I mentally place the floodplain over that same map, and there's just this little strip of safe area that's not in the floodplain and is not in the, the, the high or severe forest area. So where do we build homes? It's a, it's a policy question, but you either have floodplain or you, or you have these fire issues. The one thing with the fire issue is you as an individual have a decision on, on managing. You can make an impact on your own fire risk with your own property by home hardening and, and and having uh, you know firewise communities these things we just talked about on the floodplain on the flood scale it's much different we're talking about like Army Corps of Engineers and Department of Water Resources levies and major major investments there that you don't necessarily have a direct um, effect on yeah, great all right back there so we talked about so far educating our public right we talked about concentric circles and talking about fire safe um, you know communities and all of these things, we talk about a lot of different agent agencies, we have a lot of great representatives here. My, picture, my question is, what the big picture, who's missing from the table? Who else do we need to bring to take this idea and this, what I see as a potential solution, I hope you all have done a really good job explaining it, who else needs to come to the table to level up? That's a great question. So the question is essentially, from an implementation standpoint, Who's missing? What's next in terms of actually getting this kind of work done at the pace and scale that we need to? I, I think what we saw in the film the, is the value of partnerships. That is, it takes, it takes a community. The, the new paradigm that we're trying to get into is not just that the Forest Service manages their, all the public lands, which is, what, over 20% of the state, but they do it through the sort of partnerships that that Ellie and, and Willie and, and uh, other, other colleagues have been uh, involved in, where you bring different interests together. The forests, the new paradigm is to manage the forest as a multi-benefit asset if you're going to you know, manage it. Sustainable forests means that you, you, can, you get the multiple benefits for people, you have resilience and biodiversity, but you also have env environmental justice. And you don't get that with just a single, a single purpose management. So, you know, e even the, some of the capacity constraints that Ellie talked about in, in the film, they can be overcome when you have these partnerships. Yeah, and I just want to expand on that. Um, we have to create uh, what, what some people are calling a restoration economy. We, we, we can't accomplish what we need to just with federal and state funding uh, because th that's just not going to get us far enough and and that federal and state funding goes through cycles um, as an example you, you know we had a couple of pretty good years of federal and state funding the next couple of years are not looking so good so so then what are we going to lose all of the momentum that we've created because there's no actual like private capital private uh, economy that's that's supporting this work and, and you saw some of the ideas but we need to take some of those ideas uh to to scale because uh, you know most of that stuff you saw in, in terms of wood products and wood utilization it's at such a small scale it's not actually making the impact that it could and and so how do we get from sort of that research and development phase to broad scale implementation so that there's a market so that so, so that it doesn't cost so much to do this work and there's there's actually some economic value that's der driven if i got one more just quick tidbit yeah the the other big picture is the goal of the forest service and the state together is a million acres per year treated the costs are coming at just about two thousand dollars an acre just to do the work on the ground <laughs> yeah you know, that's not including the administrative costs so you do the arithmetic what if it's costing over two thousand dollars an acre and you're doing a million acres a year yeah i mean i'll say the good news is there's more funding getting spent on these upfront proactive projects to protect against wildfire risk than ever before state government spent over the last few years three billion dollars on these projects we have a thousand of these projects that we're partially funding across the state the federal government is now spending more money on the ground in california than it ever has so that's the good news the bad news is we haven't cracked the nut 
and help these emerging industries, sustainable, environmentally sustainable industries, um, to actually reach scale, to create that economic incentive to help us. We're trying, we're subsidizing things like advanced uh, biofuels and hydrogen production from, uh, from the forest products. We're trying to build demand for this mass timber, this small cross-laminated timber, um, but we're not there yet. Uh, so that holds a lot of promise. I mean, we've, you know, I've spent the, the, the weekend watching films on these solutions, and there's so many good solutions, um, and we just have to help them scale. So how do we do that? We're working on it, but we're not there. I, I, well, I was, one of the things I had was, wanted to bring up was the cost of it. The other thing is, this is a statewide problem. I think Jim did a very good introduction for that in the movie. And I know, I mean, the water agencies that have been the most um, active also control their water. But a lot of these water agencies don't control the water. You know, they're sitting up in the, in the foothills, I mean, up in the, um, but it's really the downstream users that own the water because of the way the water rights were given. So I'm just saying this is a, this is a statewide issue and something that really needs to be addressed. And um, I work, I'm at UC Merced and I've listened to people at Merced. They get their water, they have the water rights to the Merced River. They do not want to invest in the, foot, in the mm -hmm. restoration because they got the water rights. Um, so they said the people that live up there should take care of it. So I think that is a conversation that needs to be, be a, a, a long-term conversation. It's not going to be an easy one, but it's something that I think that we all have to um, address. All right, Aaron, I have one liner. Can I one, have one, one liner, liner. absolutely. <laughs> so, so Wade talked about these emerging technologies of the forest products, and we saw part of that at the end of the film. Here's the one liner. We don't have to create the economy. We have to integrate into it. 80% of the forest products consumed in California come from outside California. So the economy is there. We need to integrate into it. Uh, a worthy one liner. All right. <laughs> so um, I grew up here in the Sierra Nevada. I'm a second generation. Grass Valley. I'm a fifth generation Californian. I've seen uh, the state change and I'm inspired by John Muir, who founded the Sierra Club, and Gary Snyder, who wrote. Uh, uh, no, if you can read a book, it's, it's called yeah. Practice of the Wild. Yeah. Um, I was an engineer on ships all over the world for 30 years. I burned hydrocarbons, took all the goodies to all the other little piggies. And I finally did something important, which was, as you can see on my hoodie, uh, I went to uh, Sea Shepherd to help save the, uh, the whales in Antarctica. Um, being an engineer on ships, uh, you know, the full command of technology, my vision is that if we put a, a power plant on every ridge top between Kern River in Seattle or Kern River in Vancouver, uh, we could harvest the fuel loading in the forest and do what's called pyrocatalytic conversion. We make fuel, synthetic fuel, from dry chips. Uh, bring labor, and this, this is really complicated because you've got to have talent, you've got to have technology, and you have to have these variables of uh, you know, labor and competence in the forest, safety, uh, labor safety. But imagine having a, a power plant on every ridge top between, you know, Southern California and the North. What can you guys respond to in terms of that possibility of this coming to fruition? So power catalytic conversion basically takes dry chips, turns it into gas, runs it in an engine, and then makes power. So the, the question there is, again, kind of getting at that idea. What are some of these innovative technologies, innovative solutions, so that we can get these kind, this kind of work kind of self-sustaining in the economy and being, being driven and continue to happen? So I'll start on that one. So um, Yuba Water Agency is working with a handful of folks to research what type of technology we can use to take care of these forest fuels. You see in the film piles of forest debris that right now are just 
open burn, right? And so that's our kind of our default program. And you're saying use this um, catalytic technology, and there's so many technologies. There's 150-year-old technology where you just do the old school, burn it, create steam, and create electricity, which in my mind would be better than just open burning, because at least you're offsetting some fossil fuels that are on the grid. But we don't necessarily have the social license for that right now. I talked about social license earlier. Right now, the public, the society, views that as carbon emitting, and it is. It's carbon emitting. It's, but what is our alternative? Our alternative right now is either our forests burn, like they've been burning, or we open burn. We need to continue to invest in these technologies that create forest products out of this material as much as possible. And then the waste stream, we need to find the best and most usable form of fuel. And there's so many different synthetic fuels. I sit, it's almost weekly that I have someone, because I'm just partnering in the space, people use Yuba Water Agency as kind of an entry to the discussion. I have a solution, whether it's, it's some type of um, green hydrogen or some type of renewable natural gas. And this is the first I've heard of the term, the catalytic solution. But we're looking at all these solutions. And I just tell these folks that are bringing this to me, if you bring me something that is close to uh, economical, close to doesn't need, you know, 10 times the dollar input to get one times the dollar benefit, I'll invest in it. And we just need to get something that's close. So um, we're constantly researching and constantly looking into stuff. Specifically, the one that is closest for us, it is conventional biomass. It's with the Cantonville Community Partnership. Based on legislation that was created in 2012, SB 1122, it created a market for small scale biomass, very similar to how, what you just said is like, you pictured like on every ridge top from the Oregon border to Mexico, we have these units. That's what this really is. It's small scale biomass. So we're, we've invested heavily in that. Um, it's close to being uh, actually started construction. Um, however, it, even on the scale of the work we're doing in partnership with the Tahoe National Forest, it's just a small, it could only handle a small percentage of the material that will come from these projects. So. Yeah, I would just add a few, th couple things. First of all, Yuba City, or Yuba City, Yuba Water Agency is a mile ahead of almost any other water agency in the state. And Martha's right. Most water agencies in the state are not willing to invest in their headwaters because they, ex they, they say that there's not a quantified benefit for their water supply that they, that's been identified. I think it's really short-sighted. We're on this broad campaign to get more water agencies to invest in the watersheds, and, and Yuba Water Agency, Placer County Water Agency are, are leaders on that. I think we all agree that we need to move to these new technologies that will allow us to sustainably manage the forest. It needs to be ecologically based, so this is not an excuse for industrializing the forest, but we need to apply these technologies. We have a couple of major challenges, including the fact that we've externalized all of these costs, including the wildfire costs, meaning we haven't counted the, the avoided cost of actually making these investments. So they feel like really expensive investments. And biomass, which is the burning of you know, wood to create electricity, is really expensive uh, compared to solar and wind and also emits pollution. So when we talk to our uh, colleagues that are energy regulators, they say, you know, energy rates are going through the roof. We're concerned about investing in technologies that are more expensive than what we could, you know, procure energy for. So we're in a really, uh, I think, a long, a sort of a long-lasting conversation with them to start to quantify these avoided costs because that's really important. How do we manage, you know, this transition? How do we subsidize this transition? Um, to be able to do this. No doubt the technologies are there and, and many are zero carbon emission technologies. We just have to figure out how we take those, take those promising technologies and bring them to scale. Last point, the state is coming up with a, uh, an update of its uh, wood, wood utilization strategy. In other words, how we're partnering with the federal agencies, local agencies to do just this. So if you're interested, maybe through Circle, you know, we're going to be out with that strategy in the next three to six months, and that would be a, a conversation that we could have. All right. <laughs> the one-liner is, if you want the Sierra Nevada to be a carbon sink instead of a carbon source, you've got, <clears throat> you've got to sequester that material, not burn it. A hard thing to even get it off the ground. There's, they've been talking about, Steve Eubanks has been trying to get one in, 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 right here in Nevada County. It's, hasn't happened yet. That's been over 10 years. So um, 
Anyways, my, my, and, and my property is just south of the North Yuba partnership. So I, my question is, is there any talk about expanding the North Yuba partnership to the Middle Fork, because I'm just north of the Middle Fork, and, I, and I'm overwhelmed with trying to thin my forest. I have three chainsaws. <laughs> <laughs> but only two arms. <laughs> but uh, I'm slightly overwhelmed, and I, I'm not sure, you know, there's the EQIP program that I could qualify for. Are there other programs that are in the works for private property owners? Yeah, so the question is. <laughs> All right. Yep. So, yep, question is about increasing pace and scale, increasing the between national or public lands, private lands, and one of the things that I'm, I'm going to start because I, I also have a mic. Um, I am actually, Circle is actively working with Nevada Irrigation District, the other water agency, trying to look at this North Yuba Forest Partnership, scratching our heads, working with Zachary that we saw on screen, saying, okay, well, what does the South Yuba Forest Partnership and Middle Yuba Forest Partnership look like? Um, so big picture. Yeah, it took a lot to get the North Yuba off the ground, but we're trying to do that for the rest of the watershed as well. And Yeah, I'll just say, um, so, so really the question is, in my mind, about where do you go first and what about the people that aren't first? And I, I, I mean, I, I think we have to start somewhere. And so, you know, we didn't randomly select the North Yuba watershed. There was a lot of analysis that went into where's the, the biggest fire risk, where are we going to have the most impact, um, and so that's where we're starting. However, as, as Aaron pointed out, um, that model that, that we've developed collectively is spreading to other places, um, and it was just a, a year and a half ago, actually, at when the governor's task force met here in Grass Valley, that we actually signed the Middle Truckee River Forest Partnership uh, which is modeled after the North Yuba. And so, you know, I think, I think this idea that we're all going to come together, we're going to work together for common goals and, and bring whatever resources that we have to the table, not worry about whose jurisdiction and who's, you, you know, we, we, we all want the same outcomes. And so if we focus on that and work together watershed by watershed, I think we'll get there. Okay, so specific to, to your issue where you are, um, like Ellie said, we went, there were a lot of planning went into, you know, why we chose the North Yuba Forest in, in the boundary there, watershed landscape scale. Really, kind of reading the future of this work, it was, we got to think bigger, we got to think larger, we got to think faster. So we looked at landscape scale, watershed scale, so that's one of the reasons we chose the North Yuba uh, boundary, which is a watershed boundary. However, because you're in Yuba County, sir, and, and you have an interest, and I mentioned our local fire safe council in the past, one of the reasons Yuba Water Agency jumped in with both feet on the North Yuba Forest Partnership was because it was scalable and it was large and it was something we could get going that could be replicated throughout the West. However, the issue with the small, how, you have 40 acres, you said? Okay, 100 acres. So what, once you go to these smaller parcels, and I mentioned the 5, 10s, and 20s before, you have so many different interests involved. You have a lot more folks that have to get on board with the plan, whatever the plan is. I would just ask you to give me a call. I'll hook you up with the Yuba Fire Safe Council, and we'll see what landowners in your area have re reached out to them. We can add you to the conglomerate and see if there's something on a smaller scale we could do. In your, I have an interest in your watershed. <laughs> not, 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 it's not part of the North Yuba project, but it doesn't have to be to do something good there. All right, right there in the back. Yeah, thank you. A couple of things. Um, Questions, I hope. Questions. Um, you know, the urgency, of course, is pretty obvious in terms of thinning the forest, reducing the density of the trees and so on. But I'm trusting, and I assume that in the planning for the treatment projects, um, forest structure and wildlife considerations are taken into account. Retaining um, snags for having nesting birds and all that sort of thing. I just like to do that reinforced. <laughs> and then um, I, I, I think these projects have been going on for some time on, in different parts of the state. 
and perhaps there's been some follow-up studies in terms of how quickly maybe um, vegetation returns to the clear areas. I've been in some parts of the state of the Sierras where I think I've been in past treatment areas and I've seen this these dense um, uh, carpets of young conifers all about the same height you know, throughout the lower um, uh, structure. And, but anyway, uh, there's going to be follow-up costs, I'm sure, to keep making them clear. But if burning is done, then the costs of maintaining are going to be less than the costs of the capital investment to get them to the place you know, where they need to be in the first place. And those factors probably are all being considered way in the future, I'm sure. But I just wanted to throw those out there to see Okay, that's a long-term picture. Yeah, so question again about it, sort of the biologic monitoring, making sure that when we are removing wood, when we are removing trees, confirming that we're doing that with following best available science, and then what is post-project monitoring, what does follow-up work look like? And before we jump in, I'm gonna invite Melinda Booth up to the front to join our panel in the back because she was instrumental in creating this partnership uh, and representing Circle. Just notice that she's up back there. So I'll, I'll try and I'll try and um, answer very quickly. So yes, we we did um, years of surveying for um, biological resources, both uh, wildlife, botany, et cetera, archaeological resources. We we put to get we did a three year analysis. It's very robust. Uh, you're welcome to look at it online. It's called the North Yuba uh, Landscape Restoration Project Environmental Impact Statement. Um, so uh, we, we, we did put in a lot of measures to try and balance everything because I think your point is we don't want to do a lot of harm as we try and achieve the, the long-term uh, forest structure. So yeah, we, we did keep that in mind. And then on your second um, question, um, So uh, I know you, you've got the data, probably the same data I have, but we've analyzed every wildfire polygon in the Sierra Nevada and every treatment polygon in the Sierra Nevada for how fast they recover. The water use, on average, comes back in 10 to 15 years. That is, the water benefit you can think of as being about 15 years, but it decreases over time. It takes maybe 30 or more years for the carbon to come back because you're, you're getting the just less biomass there on the ground Is that the way you see it? Yeah. <laughs> and then how frequently do you have to go back in there because you know you've educated me Ellie and it's not mission accomplished once you go and you introduce prescribed fire or vegetation thinning how frequently do you have to do this yeah so um, we try and, and and get back in two to five years um, but you know as we increase the scale of restoration our ability to go back and do that prescribed fire, which yes, is much cheaper. It's like five hundred to a thousand dollars an acre instead of two thousand to five thousand dollars an acre. Um, we just need more people who are certified, capable of, of going back and doing those maintenance treatments. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, both next to each other. We've got time for both. Go ahead. Um, I just wondered if you've done any modeling. A lot of the cost is bringing the equipment in, taking the stuff out. What if you've got a gang of people with chainsaws, you went in and one out of a hundred trees, you just cut around the Cambian Lake, it will fall over time, you don't have to do a lot of work. Has anybody modeled that? So, good question is about different ways of forest management and trying to decrease that, you know, two to five thousand dollar an acre uh, cost for thinning trees. I mean, when you, when you model the f wildfire flame length, which is a measure of severity, the more fuel you have on the ground, the more flame length you're gonna get, and the more flame length you're gonna get on the ground fire, the quicker it's gonna get up into the canopy. And I think that's what actually happens. Yeah, uh, th th there's just so much material in the forest right now, we have to remove some of it, or otherwise we're not gonna s achieve our goals. Yep. So there and then in the back and then we're there if we got time. My question was, it's a little bit simple. I live in the foothills. I actually know, actually know people that are working right now up, up, in, the, up in the project. Um, I'm seeing two things. I see 
this um, uh, community of Brownsville challenge that used to be based on timber, and indeed it's a very devastated, devastated place right now. A couple of people I know they are back to logging. They're back to doing, to doing work for work for Willie and, and you guys. Um, there's a bit of respect coming back. I like that very much. And my question is, how do you get more people? Because uh, even even in my own in my own town, Oregon House, the Yuba Water Agency has sponsored um, roadside roadside thinning. We see crews, we see young people, we see people with hard hats. We the way we complain about the traffic and all that. But it's it's absolutely wonderful to see that economic activity happening with trees, with chainsaws. And uh, how how are you thinking to? Uh, entice people to jump in. Yeah, so the question is about workforce development. How do we continue to build the skill set, b build the education necessary to keep doing this kind of good work? I'll just say it's really encouraging to hear that, that you know, this work is getting people employed. Some folks that you know, lost their jobs in forestry are now back working, and that's exactly what we want to see. As was pointed out, we do have a real workforce challenge, which is we need so-called burn bosses that can oversee these prescribed fire. We need more folks that are forest technicians, watershed technicians. There's a ton of funding that's coming in from our governments, federal and state government, on training young people, uh, including tribal members. So we have a tribal conservation corps. We have these different conservation corps, but we have to do it quick. So it's retraining people that lost their jobs and training young people so that they can stay in these communities with good paying jobs. I have a question for Melinda, which is good <laughs> to see you. So now that you, now that you have a, a little bit of distance uh, from, from this project uh, and this effort, I'm just, I can take over for Aaron. Well, uh, what's, what's, what's your take on sort of you know, lessons learned from your leadership and then what you're seeing now? Well, hi, I'm honored to have been invited up. Thank you. Um, so I moved to Montana about a year ago, and we're experiencing all of the same issues. And I would guess we're maybe 10 to 15 years kind of behind where we are here. And one of the first things that I did when I moved there is I had a meeting with our forest supervisor on the Flathead National Forest, and I said, hey, I was doing all this really cool stuff, and what are you doing? And um, they're not there at all. And so what I realized is the work that is happening here, that the North, the North Yuba Forest Partnership in particular, is really special. And we're all sitting here, you hear about it, and you're like, well, duh, this no, it's a no-brainer. Of course this is what we're doing. But it's not a no-brainer in all the other places that it needs to happen. And so what's happening here is a model. And if we can figure out how to make it replicable and really get people on board, it's going to have, um, re I, be I believe, there will be real change. The question is the pace and the scale, right? All the things that we're talking about, how do we make that happen? But so my reflection is that what, what I was really lucky and honored to be a part of getting off the ground here um, is special and valuable and meaningful and every hour and every heartache and every every argument and late night and every whiskey around the campfire it's valuable and meaningful and what we did was create genuine relationships amongst people from very diverse backgrounds who have a similar goal and when you can create those personal genuine relationships you can get really hard work done and that's what's happening here but it takes time this can't go unsaid. Someone asked earlier, um, you know, who's not at the table? And that's an appropriate question. Like, who, who else needs to be here? But I think we need to recognize who is at the table because I don't know that many people or many groups are doing what this group has done. And now that Melinda's sitting up here, we can truly call out who, who is at the table. And Erin's continuing what she's doing. But I got to say, like, Doing the North Yuba Forest Partnership or anything that I've been involved in in Yuba County takes people that are creative and open-minded and want to do things different. And so Ellie, as the forest supervisor on the Tahoe, we would not be where we are without an open-minded guy like Ellie. Wade's leadership at the state level, I mean, it's totally opened up opportunities that kind of that, that parallel with the North Yuba Forest Partnership and the other stuff I talked about, these healthy forest grants that we're working on with CAL FIRE in, in that space. Um, Aaron's leadership at Circle following along with, with Melinda and then the academics, uh, uh, Martha and Roger, and then there's many others. I'm gonna leave somebody out, but let's recognize the people that are at the table that are kind of setting the tone for what needs to be done, what can be done, and how we can implement it going forward. So I have to say that. <laughs> follow up with uh, what um, Willie just said because when we came to California we've been here about 20 years we started a project 
It was called SNAP, Sierra Nevada Adaptive Management Product. And we couldn't find Forest Service partners. It took a long time. We got two forests to, to help us. I think what has happened over the last 20 years is really amazing. And this partnership and the one in the American River, again, there's another big community-driven um, project, are so important for showing the rest of the state how we can move forward. So I, I just want to say you did a great job. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Well, I think that's we got one more question. All right, one more question. There was, sorry, there was, uh, yeah, I think it actually was there. Yep, yep. So, so my question is an education question for these young people. Uh, I, I teach uh, biology and AP environmental science in Auburn. I've been there for three decades. And it, it took that long to get these kids to believe in climate change, okay? They do now, all, okay? But they don't believe in this forest thing yet. And I'm wondering if we have enough time, okay? Because we're talking about is the place gonna burn up before they believe in it? And I have guest speakers come from all kinds of different groups. And I have a director of Caltrans who's in charge of all the forests along the highway. I have one of the El Dorado County, uh, the Forest Service directors come and they did a bunch of thinning and then it all burned up in the King fire. And I've been watching, so I've known this myself for 20 years, but I don't know. I don't know, I'm just really disappointed myself. I can't get kids to sign up for AP Environmental Science now. Hey. We used to have two sections. I think they're burnt out on climate change. I think they don't want to hear it anymore. And I just wonder how you think we can reach these people when something's got to be done about the forest. All right, so question is about keeping people uh, inspired, motivated, and invested in doing the hard work, especially younger folks. Um, bring them to the Film Fest next year. I'll say that, and then I'm going to... <laughs> well, yeah, let them see this movie. But I have to say, we did an earlier movie, and we spent a lot of time defining the problem, but not the solutions. And the difference is, and I, certainly it's here, there's, there's sessions on, on solutions. And I think if we want to keep young people involved and get them involved, we have to show them there's a path. And just, you know, it's, it's not that the world's falling apart, but we actually have ways forward. Yeah. And I, so first, thank you for all your work. I have a 17-year-old, really <laughs> appreciate what you do. <laughs> and the, the other thing I'll say is, just for my 17-year-old, if you can make it look fun, get them out there to try it. Get them out there to try it, because, I mean, I'm telling you, you put a drip torch in a 17-year-old's hand? <laughs> in a safe way. In a safe way, they, they're, they're, I mean, it's fun. If you haven't done it, by the way, any of you, it's super fun if you're doing it in a safe way. So, so I think there, I think there is, but, but we have to go about it differently. We can't just like post jobs in the newspaper and assume that somebody's going to apply to it. We're, we're, we're going to have to take different approaches. And I want to say. Conservation Corps. Yeah. yeah. Biden administration yeah. announced it. Yep. So they yeah. Conservation Corps. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, you know, Jerry Brown in his first go around created the California Conservation Corps, founded. Amazing. So still going strong. 1,500 young people every year come through that program that are now doing this work across the state. We also have local cores. As I said, we now have tribal cores, and now we have the American Climate Corps, which is based on something we created in California uh, under this governor called the California Climate Corps. So young people. For the first, I mean, I think more than ever, there are, there are pathways uh, to do that. Now we just have to figure out how to engage them to, so they'll take advantage of it. All right. So we are out of time. We've got a trick, quick transition. Big round of applause for the panel. This was fantastic. Thank you all so much for being here. Still plenty of more film festival. We've got awards shows this evening and Monday night. So all of the award-winning films you can see, if you want to see those award-winning films, come to one of the theaters, either in Nevada City or Grass Valley, and stay both nights. And that way you can see all the award winners. Thank you all very much. Yeah.